Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome all participants to today's webinar. My name is Kate Half, and I am delighted to be hosting the second peer-to-peer -peer webinar on localization. It's the second of a two-part series looking at localization at the World Humanitarian Summit two years ago. The first webinar was the occasion to take a step back on the achievements following the localization commitments made at WHS and to share the, visions, the vision of the two co-chairs of the Grand Bargain Localization Workstream on the main issues, the main challenges, and what they saw as the way forward. Today, our second webinar is giving the floor to those who are at the forefront of practice, those who are actually focusing on making localization a reality. They're going to be discussing how global level commitments can be turned into operational reality. We're very lucky to have with us Martha Raidas and Yakzan Shishakli, who will highlight initiatives which empower local actors in Iraq and in support of the Syria cross-border response. They will share their experience, what they've learned, and some of the challenges that they see. Before introducing them properly, as well as the topic, I'm going to say a few words about the webinar and how it works. This webinar will last 60 minutes. The first 30 minutes, I will be asking questions to our two distinguished speakers who will be answering. And in the second 30 minutes, we will be taking questions from the participants that I will direct to the speakers. So as we go through our webinar, some requests, please. Please stay on mute throughout the webinar. Please have your camera on, oh, sorry, please have your camera off at all times. Please use the chat box on the right hand side of your WebEx window to communicate with everyone. And please use the Q&A box on the right hand side of the screen below the chat box for questions to the panelists. Also, please note that we will be running two polls during the course of the webinar. And your response to these polls is really valuable for the peer-to-peer -peer team to make sure that they continuously improve um, webinars. If you have any issues connecting at any time, please contact Venkatesh Naik via chat. Alternatively, if really you're stuck, you will be able to watch the non-interactive feed on YouTube. We will also be recording this webinar and an edited version will be uploaded onto YouTube. And you can find other peer-to-peer -peer hosted webinar recordings on the peer-to-peer -peer website or the relevant YouTube channel. So now moving to today's webinar. What do we mean by localization? The term got a lot of traction in the build-up to the World Humanitarian Summit and has become firmly established since. However, the concept is not new. We've known for a long time that local communities, civil society organizations, local NGOs, local authorities are the first responders in a crisis. They continue their engagement with affected populations during the crisis and remain after the worst impacts of the crisis are over. What is new, though, is the attention brought to local and national actor, actors and the work done to have them better recognized and supported by international responders, recognizing their essential contribution to an effective response. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt one second because I have an echo. I can, okay, I'm told it's okay. Sorry about that. So this webinar is going to focus on examples of what is being done concretely to make localization a reality and actually support it in humanitarian operations. We're also going to look at what's still necessary to achieve the grand target localization commitments. And to take us through this, I am delighted to welcome two colleagues who will share their experience and insights around making localization a reality in two extremely complex humanitarian settings, namely Iraq and Syria. 
Yes, I'm delighted to welcome Martha Raiders, who's been serving as the UN Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General, the Resident Coordinator and the Humanitarian Coordinator in Iraq since April 2018. She brings more than 27 years of experience in leading and coordinating UN development and humanitarian work in conflict and post-conflict countries. She's also got extensive experience of, supported, of supporting peace-building transitions in a number of countries, including Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Sudan. And I'm really honored to be welcoming Yaksan Shishakli, who is the founder of the Maram Foundation for Relief and Development, which provides humanitarian relief to refugees and IDPs in Jordan, Turkey, and Syria. Its activities uh, cover the spectrum of camp management, education, child protection, and psychosocial support. The Maram Foundation is a member of the Humanitarian Liaison Group, which is the equivalent of the Humanitarian Country Team for Syria Cross-Border Operations and other Whole of Syria coordination and decision-making bodies. I'm going to target my first question to you, Martha. And I'm going to ask you if, with the grand bargain targeting 25% of funding to local and national NGOs by 2020, do you think this target will be reached in the Iraq response? And if you can tell us, as a humanitarian coordinator, what concrete steps you have taken together with the HCT in Iraq to actually support local actors? Over to you, Marta. Thank you very much. Um, to answer directly about the uh, target amount, we have not in Iraq um, achieved the 25% target as of yet. Um, we think there are a number of, of factors um, that contribute to, to that. Really? Um, because I clicked through all the whole thing. Sorry? Thanks for your help. Okay. Um, and I'm so sorry, somebody else. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, back to the back to the regularly scheduled program. <laughs> so um, there are, I, I think, um, as um, the nature of the response to an L3 emergency such as Iraq. Um, the immediate massive need for large-scale bulk quantities of items, of relief items like medicines, tents, food, and, and, and other non-food items um, sort of directed the, the funding flows naturally um, to those agencies that had um, large-scale global procurement capacity. And that typically would not be the national NGOs. So at the beginning of the response period, um, it was very, very limited uh, amounts that were going to the uh, national actors. But that has gradually been changing. Um, and there's a much greater participation, both uh, in terms of the uh, decision-making and in terms of the financial and, and programmatic participation. So, um, National NGOs have been encouraged and have been uh, supported uh, to participate in the coordination architecture. They are represented in the humanitarian country team, in the clusters, in the humanitarian fund advisory board. There's also a joint national and international NGO coordination forum with whom we have a great deal of interaction. Um, so, national NGOs are fully engaged in the humanitarian response plan uh, planning and implementation, and they've received both direct and indirect funding, um, as well as capacity building from a variety of different sources. Um, <clears throat> we don't, as I said, we, we haven't reached the 25% target. As of now, um, we've, we're slightly above the 10% target. Um, but there are a number of contributory factors. I, I, I mentioned that. Part of that is um, 
the need for capacity building. So we are building um, capacity building into a number of different uh, channels so that um, national NGOs are better able to participate in the process. Um, we've provided training um, on proposal and budget development, on the grant management system, um, and other mechanisms that enable NGOs to better access funding. We've also, um, we've also launched in 2017, so last year we had an exclusive national NGO reserve allocation window in the humanitarian response to Mosul. Um, and the window targeted national NGOs who were new cluster members that had not previously received IHF funding. So the idea was to um, raise the level of participation to include new members that, that hadn't, uh, that were not familiar previous with, with the system. But um, to be honest, uh, although that was uh, entirely based on good intentions, um, it turned out that national NGOs received more than double the amount of funding and did so more quickly through the regular, the regular allocations than through the dedicated window. So we are, uh, we revised that, uh, that procedure. And, and also the, the time, the additional time that was taken to develop and ensure that proposals were of sufficient quality um, generated considerable delays in the allocation process. So um, bottom line, we are now looking at new mechanisms that can prioritize national NGO um, access to the, to the funding. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Martha. That's really interesting, a, a sort of overarching strategy around uh, supporting lo local and national NGOs, starting with a situation where you weren't able to prioritize them because of the, the requirements of a rapid um, large bulk um, distribution type response, but how you've built it uh, since and obviously learning lessons from your experience and adapting your approach as you're going along. It's a, it's a great example. Um, what are some of the example, uh, some of the obstacles that you're confronted to as you're trying to progress this system-wide approach or system-wide strategy to really enable and support local actors to be considered and to consider themselves as equal to the rest of the operation. And what are your recommendations from your experience that could be helpful for other operations seeking to have a similar approach? Yeah, I think one of the, um, one of the challenges is that many uh, bilateral donors do not directly fund national NGOs and place restrictions or place conditions on financing um, that have an immediate um, constraining effect on N national NGOs access to direct funding. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, Secondly, I, I sort of touched on it uh, earlier, the NGO partner capacity uh, and the understanding of the humanitarian system and, and how it works, including humanitarian principles. Um, that's, that's been an issue here in Iraq. It may not be the case uh, everywhere. And of course, there are ways to, to address that um, through the capacity building mechanisms, for example, that I mentioned, but that's a, a longer term, um, a longer term effort. It requires a system wide investment of, of time and of financial resources. One, one important factor in the case of Iraq, uh, and it has a great deal to do, I think, with the um, oil economy, but uh, there is, there's wide scale fraud and misuse of funding. Um, across the board, not just in humanitarian, um, as in humanitarian funding, but um, there is a, a, a large risk placed on the humanitarian fund. So we, we need a lot of uh, control mechanisms and a lot of capacity building. Um, so that's, um, that's another issue. Um, but 
I think the 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 biggest the biggest constraint is capacity building. Um, that needs to be a recurring and essentially a, a continuing element in any um, in any collaboration with the national NGO sector. Um, and, and country-based pooled funds are well placed to do that. But the wider humanitarian community also needs to play a role in that if um, if the grand bargain commitments are are going to be fulfilled. Um, we are continuing to prioritize direct funding of national NGOs where it's feasible and where it's appropriate. We're also trying to prioritize projects um, that have partnership built in between either INGOs or UN uh, partners on the one hand and national NGOs on the other and that have uh, concrete capacity building outcomes built into the proposal so that that um, can become uh, part of the capacity building mechanism as implementation takes place. One thing that might be um, worth considering is whether um, we might consider the grand bargain localization agenda to be more than just national NGOs, but national actors more broadly speaking, because there are a lot of national actors that also participate um, in this in the implementation of the humanitarian response plan. Um, but somehow we've narrowed in on the, on the national NGO sector. Um, I think I will leave my answer there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. You've, you've really made it very clear that we need a multi-pronged um, approach looking at capacity building, resourcing partnerships, and you're also raising the question of whether or not uh, we should consider broader than, than national and local NGOs when we look at um, localization. I've also heard the fact that bilateral donors need to uh, revise their condition and their approaches to funding to really support the localization agenda. So thank you very much for, for that. I'm now going to move uh, to you, Yakzan, and I'm going to, um, to ask you, the, the peer to peer project recently visited Gaziantep to learn more about the support provided by the humanitarian leadership and the humanitarian response to local actors operating in the Syria response, which is deemed to be quite advanced compared to other operations. And the lessons learned from this mission have been um, captured in a practical note. With the Maram Foundation, uh, you are a national NGO representative and uh, HCT humanitarian country team member. How, from your perspective, have you managed to ensure that your voice and the one of the other national NGOs are part of the, are part of the decision making and part of the planning? How do you ensure that your voice is heard, including at the strategic level? And the second part to this question, uh, how has this been facilitated by others, especially the humanitarian country team and the humanitarian liaison group? Over to you. Hi, uh, first, I'd like to thank you for hosting this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to participate to the, such important dis discussion. Uh, first, we recognize the importance of attendance at the cluster and sub-cluster meetings at every opportunity. Also, participate, participating in cluster meetings and awareness raising sessions allow all the local and national NGOs to collaborate in international national and local actors. So simply showing up and actively participate, participate in one way, we ensure that our views are heard. Second, in other way, it's an incentive we have the place to ensure our cluster vocal point related staff engage fully in the cluster meetings. What I mean, like for example, what we do in Maram. We meet every Tuesday. We have everybody from the team. We do like collective information together. We put all the information on the table. We design some kind of um, for PowerPoint. We share what the need. Then we take the information in very uh, designed way 
and take it to the cluster. Despite, despite, despite this, we, and I speak here in collective national NGOs, have faced many challenges in terms of having the opportunity to participate in decision making and having our views both heard and respected. I mean, for many reasons. And one of the main ways we work on to guarantee that our voice and of, I mean, uh, our voice as a man and other national NGOs to be heard loud and clear is to just like uh, through active partic participation, where I encourage everybody to participate participate in all this meeting. In some uh, many NGOs, we gather we gather together and we created networks, and this is very important actually and very good experience. As the NGOs, there is over 150 registered local NGO uh, at the OCHA. So those number of uh, uh, local NGOs gathered together and created some kind of form and platform of networks to have uh, more power, to have higher voice, it means the NGOs are outnumbered the international NGOs on this. Together, we can attend all the meetings because also one of the problem we have we cannot, as a local NGOs, and we don't have the capacity to attend all the meetings happening. Our international NGOs, they have b uh, bigger staff, more experience, and we, as a local NGO, we had less experience and less staff to be uh, to attend those meetings. So the network will, will act on behalf of other local NGOs. We hire collectively uh, more experienced people uh, to attend those meetings. And as Maram, you mentioned, we're part of the humanitarian lead HLG and we're part of the SLG. So we directly uh, involved in strategic decision making. And this also, we go back to the local NGOs and to the local partners where we represent them for like at least one meeting every two weeks to uh, have their views and take their views and go back to the uh, to the SAG panel or to the HLG platform and kind of reflect the need of the local NGOs. And it's, it's been very like a uh, um, uh, working mechanism. And on the other side, we say the partners, in this case, like the UN agencies and INGOs, they're willing to hear and they were really supportive. Thank you very much, uh, Yaxan. It's, um, I mean, a very, very clear strategy to overcome the challenges of active participation. On the one hand, make sure that your focal points are very well briefed, very well informed by the, your operational reality, and that of the other national NGOs, and the creation of networks in which you come together to optimize resources to make sure that you can be presented at the right level in all these meetings. So thank you very much for that. If I move to the next question, what do you think uh, remains to happen? What should, be, what should be happening for local and national NGOs to be really considered uh, equal partners? What are your recommendations to help national NGOs in Syria? Well, definitely we have a long way to go before getting an equal footing. However, we are on the right track. I mean, we started as a Syrian NGOs. Uh, uh, but first, I think one of the main important points in terms of funding, simply there is not enough of it. There, there was a study uh, released by the Local to Global in uh, 2014. The Syrian humanitarian actors received 0.3% of direct funding and 93 from indirect cash funding available, uh, despite being responsible for delivering 75% of the humanitarian assistance in the same year. And that's a really shocking number. Uh, and that's 2014. And I mentioned this to show you, like in 2017 and 18, how we just improved a little bit, or maybe improved more than 50% funding-wise, and actually capacity-wise. 
The other thing, since the beginning of the crisis, the national NGO have struggled to get even the most basic costs covered within the partnership. And so we've been kind of treated like a subcontractor, not as a partner in the very beginning. Uh, and subcontractor or implementing partner will doesn't mean fully partnership. So we, I mean, I think in any proposal, any uh, partnership, it should start from the beginning of the partnership. We should not be, as a local NGOs, be treated as less. Yes, we have less experience, but we have the culture, we have uh, like the presence, so we can cooperate together with the experience of our international NGOs and the, the culture and the communication we have with the locals as a local NGO, we can put things together. We, we should be treated equally, especially when it comes to funds. And I, will, I want to mention very good experience we have. In the context of Syria, we have uh, like uh, I'm going to talk about the HF fund. It's really important because HF was really a big shift for the local NGO. HF, the humanitarian pool fund, was very important in shifting the local NGO capacity because uh, the humanitarian pool fund gives direct direct funding to the local NGOs. Uh, it it was a massive game changer. It provides success, successfully applicants with up to seven percent overhead and that's what we really need as a local NGOs. We don't really have the capacity and we don't have the funds to build our capacity. So the HF was really helpful and they delivered I'll give you a number here. Since two thousand fifteen more than um uh, I'll look at the number and well I lost it somewhere. But actually it's a huge number. And as just like as my own foundation we benefited in 2015 to today with more than 15 projects, directly and indirectly with the other partners. So I will show you, like, this shows how the, actually, the UN agency committed to help the local NGOs and us, how we are trying to uh, improve the, uh, our work. And there's something also I would like to mention. Uh, the lack of advocate funding has domino effect for example, national NGOs often use a part of our financial resources to train staff and provide them with experience in the field, rebuild their capacity, yet there are a little contractual security and incentive for local staff to remain in the local NGO. We cannot afford high salaries, job security, health insurance, and even maternity leave. In time, of qualified staff leave to better pay job uh, and position. With the like international NGOs. So that's what sent us as a local NGO to, to square one. This continues like to, to have the brain drain. It really cost us time, money, and opportunity. So our space in, for improvement is limited in here. For most part, we remain uh, just like a little guy who would like, every time we try to go up, go up somebody put us down. I will leave it here. I have actually two more pages, but I'll leave it here for the time. Thank you very much, Exan. I think I think this is really helpful. Um, I I hear that um, both you and Marta are seeing a lot of positive developments. Uh, what we are seeing is that national and local NGOs are included and in in coordination and leadership mechanisms are making their voice heard are included in not just in the implementation but also in the planning and the strategic decision making. That there are several um, different initiatives to ensure um, some level of direct resourcing to national NGOs. That there's even the example of the uh, humanitarian fund in Syria which um, you, you talked about Aksan, as, a, as a game changer. So the, the recognizing the importance not just of funding but also of the type of funding, i.e. Uh, funds going to um, to cover the overheads. Um, you've obviously both of you identified still a number of challenges, but I must say it's looking as if there's significant progress in that area. 
I'm also hearing that donors need to, uh, while supporting, obviously they're supporting these country-based pool funds which are making a significant difference and they are beginning to adapt their funding mechanism, there's still a long way to, to go. Um, thank you very much for both. I've got a number of questions which are coming for, from the audience. Uh, which are beginning to come through. Um, let me check. Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Martha, if that's okay, um, whether how you think in practice a mutual risk mitigation involving local and national actors uh, as well as international in looking at how to manage risk uh, could look like. Over to you, Martha. Uh, well, managing risk um, depends critically on, on a number of different factors and um, it includes, again, back to, um, back to one of the main threads, um, a huge helping of capacity building, um, but it also includes a great deal of the overall um, operating context and, and I think experience. Um, we we started um, our humanitarian response with um, a lack of experience um, built up. Uh, obviously, historically, there has been a, a thriving uh, national uh, civil society, but that that was undone by the conflict, and and we started off with um, a real lack of this. Um, one one problem as well is that in the direct aftermath to the conflict, the drive for um, humanitarian delivery was so strong that um, that we were almost um, putting aside all the concerns of risk management, and we are this year reaping the rewards um, by having um, large amounts of uh, investigations res that that were backlogged that have detected a great deal uh, a great number of problems and that's impacting on the overall um, overall relationship between the humanitarian country team and and the national actors uh, involved in that. But I think um, what uh, Yaxan mentioned as well in terms of the participation. Um, participation in the discussions and the decision making. There's a great deal of discussions in the country team um, and associated uh, governance mechanisms about risk management um, or that, that somehow have an impact on that. Um, I would say the, the donors as well have a role to play in this. Um, that's, uh, that they're an important contribution as well. Um, maybe I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, what I'm really <clears throat> hearing also is that this is a relationship which is built over time. So you may not be able to set up the best systems at the beginning, but as um, you learn to work together, national NGOs and international actors, it can really improve and you can develop mechanisms over time. I think that's a really important dimension to keep in um, consideration. I'm going to turn to you, Yakzan. You talked about uh, the importance of equal partnerships uh, with, national act with international actors. What elements do you think should partnership agreements include to really help strengthen um, that dimension? Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, I mean, equality of partnership uh, will take a different way here because we definitely understand the international NGOs being in humanitarian field for 20 or t uh, tens of years, and as a local NGOs, we just knew. So basically, partnership here, that means we complement each other, we complete each other. Um, let's say the when they writing the proposal, they should consider the capacity building for the local NGOs. I will, I mean, uh, probably they can hire a full-time person to support the local NGOs to get to the st standard they're expecting from the 
uh, from us as a national or local NGOs, having a full-time uh, person with experience within this local NGO will support and put the system in place, will build the trust, and also will get us to different level of, of standards. And as a local NGO, we cannot afford to hire uh, somebody with such experience. As uh, international, I mean, again, I'm saying international NGOs or donor agencies, government donors, they can't afford this person. And that's in a way like part of the building the trust. And then we take things to the next step. There's a really good example of supporting the local uh, NGOs community in building their capacity and building, uh, focusing in certain group, like in, uh, I would say in Turkey, we started, uh, I would I, I would not claim Maram started, but as a community uh, started the Women Network, a humanitarian network. It's to support women within the humanitarian network to work in Syria. So this part of capacity building, and I think it was the first of its kind, and also was uh, supported by one of the UN agencies, would build the capacity. We ta here we're targeting certain group, we're targeting women, but that's also part of the capacity building to the whole NGO community in the area. That's great, Yaksan. Thank you very much. Um, this is a follow-up question which I'm going to ask both of you and maybe Martha if you can start. Um, what are the methods uh, to measure um, successful capacity building, to monitor whether capacity building is going in the right direction um, that uh, you've seen um, as, as positive measures and you think we could learn from? And do you believe that sort of institutionalizing these in uh, partnership agreements by donors would actually be helpful? Over to you, Martha. Uh, that, uh a good question and a complicated one. Um, we, I, I mean, it's complicated in a way because the only um, really good method is one that uh, that contrasts uh, participation over time. So it, it takes, unfortunately, um, quite a bit of time to really um, get the verified information. On the other hand, we can have sort of a, a feel, a fingertip feel information uh, over a shorter period of time. Um, we do have um, a, uh, a classification um, of partners by risk level, and there is a, um, a methodology by which we, uh, we assign a partner to high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Um, so, you know, if, if we have an increase in partners that uh, are classified as low risk, I would consider that an, uh, a positive sign of um, capacity building having been successful. Um, I would say the fingertip feeling type is just by the um, amount of participation, the quality of the participation, and the, uh, the quantity of the, um, of the proposals that are received. But by and large, it would be um, by the uh, by the risk level, by the um, reduced amount of uh, of um, sort of qualified um, assessments of NGOs, uh, and um, by the increased percentage of the grand bargain uh, of the grand bargain target uh, achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, classification uh, by risk level, reduced amount of qualified assessment by NGOs, and um, target the funding targets uh, in the grand bargain. Great, great indicators. What uh, What do you think, Yaxan? Do you agree with Martha, or would you have a slightly different perspective? No, I totally agree with Martha. But I want to add. I mean, we need to design capacity building. Uh, according to the situation and meeting with the local partners. So we need to like stay out of the like teacher student exercise. Uh, again, we understand we as a local NGO with less experience, but we need to be part of designing the program. So we cannot say this work in such a country and one size fits all. No, we need to be participate in designing the program together with the, the donor. It's, it's, to to say exactly what do we 
me. And of course, the donor will also have their own code. So to get so we design any program to support our community. We cannot be like again the teacher, the students are just getting something already designed, a textbook. We need to uh, follow up. We need to have our own touch with the uh, culture touch and our our community input to get to the better level. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you a slightly different question, Martha. There was recently a localization mission which took place in Iraq in the context of the Grand Bargain uh, localization work stream. Are you able to share some of these conclusions with us? Um, they, I, I only they they had a two-part mission, one part in Baghdad, and they ended the mission uh, up in Erbil and, and um, had some field missions. So I only um, met with them while they were here in Baghdad. So I don't really have um, the outcome of their field missions. But um, the discussion that we had with them was very much along the lines that we are having now. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of some of what I have um, fed into today's discussion uh, comes from that discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, Yakuzan, you talked earlier about the brain drain of uh, trained and competent NGO, national NGO staff. Um, then moving on to INGOs or UN agencies. Um, obviously, beyond um, increase, the ability to increase salaries, uh, which is linked to funding, do you have any suggestions on how this can be mitigated? Over to you. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, I know we're not only as a local NGO, we face this problem. I was talking to a few other colleagues from even international NGOs. They have sort of uh, this problem between each other. I mean, probably if we design some kind of program not to drain or to, I will say, to, to agree not to drain and people from local organization. Instead, we pay, we pay them more while they are doing the work in the local organization, meaning supporting them. And again, it's not only salaries, it's insurance, maternity leaves, it's just like other, all the incentives they can have in uh, bigger, like with the bigger INGOs and UN agencies. And the other thing we, we, we as local NGOs, we, we cannot plan strategically for two or three years. Unlike uh, the bigger partner, they totally have the plan for one year, two years, three years, and if it doesn't work, they can move their staff to other country or they can support their staff even if probably they put their office in hold. We as a local NGO, the donor decided to finish this project today and it happened, we have to tell everybody to go home. So we, we need to work in some kind of, again, we're going back to real partnership, not to give an order, yes, and we need to treat our staff and local NGOs just like the international staff being treated within the international and UN agencies. Thank you very much. I think that's an important point. It's not just about salaries, it's also about working conditions and the ability to project oneself. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to move into the area of uh, national actors' participation in uh, strategic decision-making in the context of the HCT. And I'm, uh, I'm going to ask both of you, because um, Martha, you're, you're actually chairing the HCT, and uh, Yaksan, you're a member of the HCT, so I'm going to ask both of you from your own perspective, how can you really make sure uh, from where you sit to that the voice, the position articulated by national NGO representatives can be um, as influential of that, of that of other actors in HCT discussions. And if you've got any example of, your, of decisions which were taken as a result of input from um, national actors, that would be very welcome. Uh, Martha, if we can start with you. Um. 
I, I've always found actually that um, that if um, national NGOs participate actively and, and c contribute actively to the decision making, um, I, and I think Yaksan was getting into um, that kind of a of a recommendation earlier. Uh, if they if they genuinely engage, um, they are much more listened to. Than, uh, than otherwise. I think the problem generally is a reluctance to actively engage. But um, once they do, uh, the contribution that they have to make is such that um, they almost naturally come into the decision making. Having said that, of course, um, there are mechanisms in place. Um, we've discussed some of them. Um, you know, there's there's the uh, NGO uh, coordinating mechanisms that allow for uh, a greater representation to be engaged with, especially for smaller NGOs. They they represent their views. There are um, uh, on the part of uh, the humanitarian country team, we try to do stakeholder surveys to try to um, uh, have specific inputs um, even when NGOs uh, do not participate uh, necessarily as a, as a general rule that we can we can make sure that we do get their opinions through these surveys um, but um, in other cases um, if they are if they are stuffed up to the level that enables them to um, to sort of take charge of some cluster um, responsibilities, uh, then, you know, that could be also a very useful mechanism for uh, engaging at higher levels of decision making. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, active participation, active input is definitely the key. And once that's overcome, you're seeing a dif significant difference when you also got a certain number of mechanisms such as survey specific inputs uh, through clusters that you can activate or promote to make sure that they're given the sp that they're able to make their voice heard. Yakzan, how do you make that work for yourself? How do you make sure that your voice is heard? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, um, well, uh, first, as a look at you, in, in a few years ago, we were not being invited to all the, say, coordination in the very beginning, and that's for lack of people who have the language barrier, and actually other meetings who, which took place in other countries, and like we did not have access to visas. And like many many small issues together, so I've been in a meeting where I'm the only Syrian NGO, and like many others and INGOs. But now I would say, like after uh, seven years or eight years of the conflict, we reach out to a point. I believe in most coordination meetings we have a quota now. The we they invite certain number of Syrian NGOs to be heard and we communicate directly with the decision makers in every meeting. And that was not easy. That's why I encourage, again, every meeting for local NGOs, they need to attend, they need to participate, they need to talk loudly to get to, to the second step where they will be invited. Because if you don't attend the coordination meeting from the beginning, they will not invite you to the meeting that comes after. And we also communication and, again, the creation of the network, so we're not talking about uh, five NGOs or 100 NGO. every NGO goes to the coordination mechanism and say, I want to attend. No, we have networks, we have elections, and that takes us to different level, and that will make our voice be heard by the donor community or the decision makers in the network. Thank you very much, Yaksan. Um, again, as you had earlier, you're really, really emphasizing the importance of um, engagement by national NGOs and making sure that they're, they're pooling their resources together to do that in the most effective ways, which really goes to what Martha was saying also. The more active uh, national NGOs are, the more, uh, the, more the, the more they will be listened to. So 
um, that's that's I think very very clear messages. The impetus is really on uh, on both sides. If we're talking about sides, sides, sorry, that's maybe not very appropriate. I'm going to ask Martha if you've got any suggestions for donors in country, the donors which are represented in country, about what they could do more to help uh, national NGOs access direct funding. I'm sorry, uh, the the microphone was uh, off offline for a bit. Um, I, what can donors do more? Uh, I think you know I've, I've mentioned capacity building a lot, um, and and I, I take Yaksan's point. It's not in a teacher uh, mechanism; it's more in a partnership mechanism. But it's still required, and. Capacity building generally, uh, although it doesn't need to be very expensive, it still requires resources. So um, bearing this in mind and, and allowing a certain uh, amount of money to be set aside for capacity building uh, would be one way to, to try to foster this. Um, uh, potentially some... Um, uh, more material support to national NGOs, such as um, uh, secretariat support to enable their participation, or uh, some some more some other type of organizational mechanism that that will enable um, their numbers somehow their staffing numbers to be um, maximized through uh, you know through other in in Sudan before I came to Iraq. Uh, there was one um, person hired specifically for um, for to participate on their behalf in uh, in certain forums because they didn't they didn't have um, the staffing required necessarily in in their NGOs. So you know some something like that 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 could help them to participate more actively might be something um, to look into. And then, of course, um, trying to uh, channel funding directly to national NGOs. Thank you very much. Listening to all the, the options that you proposed, it seems to me that what they should be doing as a starting point is really sit down with national NGOs and have a discussion as to what could be most helpful considering their, their own constraints. Um, I'm going to ask Yaksan a slightly um, provocative question, an interesting question which has come through. Um, do you think it would be helpful to have independent organizations which are specialized in supporting national NGO capacities, uh, which are independent from NGOs, to really be in charge of capacity building? Uh, this question is very important. Without uh, getting my partners upset, yes, definitely. It's very important to have like a organization who's separately working 100% in supporting the local NGOs. I mean, of course, our partners are doing a great job, but when you have somebody special, all what they need to do is to come and support the local NGOs, and we can like do measuring for their work and their their success, and, and later for funding also issues. If they continue and they have successful stories, they will get more funding. And that will be actually ideal. And I don't see it very hard to happen. Thank you very much, Exad. I'm, I'm smiling. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I think it needs more funding, though, with where we go in circles. But um, thank you very much for that. I'm just going to remind all participants that the closing poll is now out. Uh, we'll be closing in about five minutes. So please make sure you, you answer the poll, as this is really helpful for the peer-to-peer -peer team to maintain the quality of these webinars. Um, I'm going to um, come up with a last, um, well, I don't know if it would be the last question, maybe before last question. Um, you've both spoken a lot about the value of country-based pool funds, uh, 
whether they're called uh, country-based pool funds or humanitarian funds, in actually targeting specific resources to national NGOs and uh, capacity, capacity building. Do you think that they are sufficient, the capacity building uh, activities under the country-based pool funds are sufficient, are adequate as they are, or do you think more could be done? And I'm going to ask Martha first and then Yaksan. Over to you, Martha. Well, in my experience, capacity build, the available capacity building is never enough. Um, but having said that, um, you know, it, it is at least dedicated. Um, it, capacity, uh, the country-based pooled funds were never uh, intended to be um, so directed towards trying to get national NGOs uh, on board in, in the participation in the HRP, and yet they have turned out to be that way. Um, and I think that's significant in in that, you know, that's an advisory board uh, that makes the decision that, that um, really looks into what works and what uh, is most uh, effective. So um, if we can if we can take that to the broader uh, decision making in a manner that that um, translates these lessons to 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 other funding sources, it would be great. But no, I don't think it's enough, of course. Thank you very much, Martha. What do you think, Yaksan? I totally agree with Martha. I mean, capacity building is never enough, whether for local NGOs uh, or international NGOs. The, we need the, the, this HF was very helpful in helping. And again, I use the Women uh, Humanitarian Network as an example. It was like supported by the HF, and we really like it's a successful story to mention. But again, as Marta said, maybe we need to go to higher level and have better mechanism or specialized funding, more specialized funding, going directly only for capacity building. Thank you very much. I've got um, I've got a few questions which are coming in, which are questioning whether or not the international um, architecture or the international system is really serious about localization and whether in reality national NGOs really have enough capacity to receive as much funding as the um, requirements which are made in the grand bargain. Um, I think that both of you have demonstrated that actually within relatively short periods of time a lot of progress has already been made. Do you think it's realistic to expect that by 2020 we would actually be in situations where national NGOs, national and local NGOs would be receiving 25% of available funding with the capacity to deliver effectively? Um, I'll ask Martha first and then Yaksan. Um, I think uh, it's feasible, um, but I think it requires um, a lot more effort um, on the part, I think in particular, of um, the, uh, inter the donors um, to some extent. I mean, I think there's a, a, a reasonable goodwill in the field in general. It's more, um, I, I agree with whoever um, sent the question in, it's the architecture, the, the headquarters or, or capital decision-making mechanism is a, is a complicated one for, for their representatives in the field that try to make uh, the grand bargain happen. Over. Thank you very much, Martha. What about, what do you think, Yaksan? Well, I totally understand where the question is coming from. As a local NGO, we think that at some point the international donors are not very serious, but I can tell you they're very serious. Me being here, this seminar, that means they're really considering, our, looking for a way how we they can help to reach this goal. So I think this goal is uh, still hard to reach because, I mean, country to country, there's a big difference between the political, uh, uh, let's say, political game, the war is different from country to country, but I think there's a will. And I look at NGOs also they want to learn. So just in 
we need to put the both sides together to go to the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I th yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to. I'm going. We we're, we're approaching the end. I'm just going to to say a few closing remarks. First of all, Martha and Yakzan, I would like to thank you both. Um, you've it's been it's been fantastic um, having both of you have this dialogue. I've certainly le learned a lot. Um, I think what I've taken out of this uh, discussion is that with consistent engagement and um, a consistent strategy over a period of time, we are seeing significant progress. There's still a lot to be done, but I have, I have learned today that in two highly complex and fluid environments, conflict environments such as Iraq and Syria, there's been significant process in, uh, towards localization within these two contexts, and I think that's extremely positive. There is a still a lot more which can be done um, around, I think, equalizing the terms of the discussion around partnership and about how we work together and how we listen to each other to decide what the best approach is, building on the complementarity and mutual respect. And I'm really hearing that there's still a lot at the global level of uh, challenges to overcome in relation to how donors fund and support these operations. So thank you both very much for a, a very, very um, exciting discussion. I would also like to thank all our participants for being with us today and for all these fantastic um, questions. And of course, thanks, the, thanks a huge thanks to the peer-to-peer team for making this happen. Have a lovely end of day or start of day, depending on where you are, and um, lovely to be with you today. Goodbye.